decoupling, de-risking, whatever you want to call it. Now, what's interesting about that is the global supply chain always finds a way around it. So, for example, you know, if uh, Trump put tariffs on China, uh, Biden continued them. Um, and so what you're seeing a lot of now is that goods that are made in uh, China are brought into a port of entry such as Vancouver or a Mexican port. And then they're trucked across the border through a NAFTA tree, free trade agreement, right? I would now like to go with you into the second segment. Um, everybody, I'm still talking to a Professor Jack Buffington from Denver University, uh, the supply chain specialist. If you haven't seen the first segment yet, uh, you can you can watch it there where he talks about uh, about his book. And in this segment, we would like to talk a little bit more about current affairs. But let's maybe start with just one uh, one more thing about supply chains, uh, because in my in my mind, the supply chain, <laughs> because of the word chain. It seems to be linear. Uh, one one thing interlocking with the next, and in order to go to the next, you need the previous one. But actually, from our previous discussion, I get this this image that we should change that metaphor toward a supply network, right? Because the whole point is it's spread out and it is it's it's multidimensional. Is that about right? That is right, and I would also add to that another reason why we need to change that definition and uh, metaphor of a supply chain is from a sustainability standpoint. You know, right now, the way supply chains work is, um, actually supply chains make money on waste. Um, we actually make more due, I mean, uh, every company makes money due to waste. Um, the only way you would reduce waste is by running out of something and we never wanna run out of something. So, you know, not only from a, um, from a public affairs standpoint, but from a sustainability standpoint, you're absolutely right. It needs to be more of a network. And so what did you make of uh, Janet Yellen's statement about China um, being being uh, the guilty of overproduction? Uh, do you agree with that statement or how do you interpret that? Um, I, I think it's really, um, the right word would be ridiculous. Um, if you think it what's happened to, you know, from China over the last 20 so years, it grew based on being a production based economy. And even though they took 800, 800 million people from out of poverty, there's still socioeconomic problems um, that China has to address when it comes to their 1.2 billion people. Right now, you know, as you know, uh, their economy is impacted by a uh, real estate collapse because they overinvested in uh, capital expenditure. Um, they're not quite ready to become a consumer-based economy like the United States. And on top of that, uh, countries around the world are trying to decouple away from China due to geopolitics and also due to an over-reliance that they realized due to the COVID-19 pandemic, right? When you know, we couldn't get mat, we couldn't get masks. Um, we could. There's certain pharmaceuticals that are, you know, that generic drugs are made in China, and we ran out of drugs. Um, automotive parts that are actually um, were the first thing that was impacted due to being in the Hubei province. So uh, China's economy is very much based on production. Now, another thing that I thought was interesting about what she said is she focused on the green economy. You know, she focused on solar panels and batteries and everything like that. And I thought that that was that was unfortunate um, because I think, you know, the Chinese economy helping to create cheaper solar panels and cheaper batteries um, would enable this, you know, this green revolution. In fact, when you talk about certain countries in the world that are running out of power in Africa and places like that, isn't that what we should be focused on? So it seemed to me to be a bit condescending for you know the American uh, Treasury Secretary to lecture the Chinese whose economy is doing very poorly right now on why they should be producing less just because it was not good for the United States. Yeah, so and it it also shows that the U.S. is not only it doesn't only care about its own market because its own market it controls. It also wants to tell uh, other large producers how they can treat other uh, third 
country markets, which I don't think will fly with the Chinese, not at all. It's just interesting that she even tried or that the US government decided to even try to, to impact the supply side of global market uh, economy. Yeah, yeah, I, I thought it was very unfortunate. And to your point, you know, I don't think the Chinese paid much attention to it. You know, as, you know, like electric vehicles is um, China is starting to make some of the best electric vehicles in the world. Um, and that's, you know, actually an area where they're innovating. So um, a global supply chain would build upon that. You know, we would learn from that. Other car makers would improve from that. So um, discouraging innovation, which is interesting because, you know, China really is hasn't been an innovator and they're starting to innovate in some areas. So. I thought there would have been a better way of handling that. You also used this term of decoupling. And this is interesting because the Biden administration started out with it. They said we have to decouple from China. But by now they have toned down the rhetoric. They have kind of switched to the, the word of de-risking, which to me seems to, a toning down. I mean, they must have understood that decoupling is probably... I mean, it's not a, it's not possible to cut off the ties between the U.S. and China, right? Because there's just too much interlinking. And we see that when like U.S. Uh, industry leaders go to China and even meet with Xi Jinping, including uh, people like uh, the, the, the top executives of, of Apple, right? So um, what's your interpretation of, of this development over the last four years of Biden? Yeah, one thing I would tell you though is I think it began before Biden. I mean, Trump started with the tariffs that really led to decoupling, de-risking, whatever you want to call it. Now, what's interesting about that is the global supply chain always finds a way around it. So, for example, you know, if uh, Trump put tariffs on China, uh, Biden continued them. Um, and so, what you're seeing a lot of now is that goods that are made in uh, China are brought into a port of entry such as Vancouver or a Mexican port. And then they're trucked across the border through a NAFTA tree, free trade agreement, right? So, um, but, I, but I will tell you that there have been um, improvements that have been made here when it comes to um, decoupling or de-risking away from China. Um, the iPhone is now made in India. It's the first time it's ever been made there. Now, What's interesting about that is that has as much to do with consumer markets as it has to do with the manufacturing base, um, because Apple is moving the production there because the Indian market has greater potential uh, than China, given socioeconomics. Now, the other thing that you're seeing, which relates to decoupling and de-risking, is the sphere of influences of the supply chain breaking in two where China is creating this Belt and Road Initiative, where they're building a landmass infrastructure between China all the way to Europe. And the United States is actually doing something very similar. It's creating this uh, Western Hemisphere supply chain, which um, is expanding beyond Mexico to include Ecuador, Colombia, um, because you know there's not enough people in Mexico to displace everything away from China so now Mexico has its own Mexico, you know, so we're expanding into South America in order to be able to do cheaper production into South America. And then Mexico is becoming higher up on the chain, which, by the way, is a fantastic policy for the United States, because if you want to control um, illegal immigration, which is in the United States, the best way to do that is to provide economic opportunities to people so that they don't leave. So people are not migrating from Mexico into the United States now. They're mainly people that are in South America. So we're creating this Western Hemisphere supply chain. And, um, you know, the United States and, and countries like that are talking about de-risking. China's doing the same thing with the Belt and Road Initiative. It's just, you know, unfortunately, the continent of Europe is, is kind of left in between. But you're starting to see decoupling happen um, from both China and the U.S., I'm not that sure that this is such an unfortunate thing because um, and we need we really need to discuss this. The often what you see, especially during times of of crisis, is that third actors start taking up this role of intermediaries, and we can see that in a 
A very simple example with India that has started buying the cheap oil from Russia, refine it and then sell, sell, sell the rest back to the Europeans who can claim that they're not using any kind of Russian oil, which they know is untrue, but you can claim it on paper because they still need it and the Indians are able to, to perform that role, right? And in do you think this is a this is a, a likely outcome that there will be in between zones that will try to benefit from from both of these supply chain networks and then actually also start breaching them um maybe even even with the consent of the, the other two yeah you're starting to see that and if we go back to what we talked about in the first episode is the the big uh driver what's happening here is not enough demand and um, a you know significant amount of supply that ties to labor, and so you know China always mentioned to the West is that we should focus on what's in our best interest instead of ideology and everything like that. And you know the one thing that China uh, they actually are getting what they ask for is that a lot of this decoupling has to do with what's in the best interest of every nation. And so I think you're absolutely right is you're going to see some strange bedfellows of how these things work based on special interests, including Europe. I think, you know, like the connection between the United States and Europe um, may change given what's happening with energy or may, you know, have to do with what's happening in manufacturing. And so I think right now what we're seeing in supply chain, it's actually even more complex than saying there's these two spheres of influence, I think the whole world's in play. And how big is the role of um, another topic that I think we never really touch up on is standardization? Because it's it's really it's really interesting that, you know, there was this big discussion here in Japan in the foreign policy world a couple of years ago, because Japan was bidding together with China to build a, a big railroad for Indonesia. And Indonesia basically had two offers on the table. And the Japanese thought they got the bit, but then in the end, Indonesia went for China. And then people over here said like, okay, this is unfortunate, but because the Chinese copied our trains and our train lines and everything, okay, they can build the train ways, but our trains would be compatible running on those. So we can bid again to then in the future, maybe sell them trains. <laughs> I found that a very interesting example, which comes down to standardization, which is also something that has been going forward. Is that something that in your mind would keep the, the global economy still compatible with each other? Well, I think the beauty of moving from a physical to a digital supply chain is you have fewer problems with standardization. Um, and I think this gets into, you know, the digitized design and manufacturing of something, you know, when maybe not for a rail network, but for other things um, when it comes to customization. And I think um, in a world where there's more supply and less demand, um, you move away from mass production and move more towards customization, especially when it relates to technology. Um, and so I think that has a lot to do with what's best for a local community, how this relates from one location to another when it comes to you know, who's going to provide the capital for something. Uh, that's a whole different ballgame. I think that's more in your wheelhouse than mine. Right, right. But the fracturing of the global economy is going to lead to um, new ways of the supply networks to actually link up. Uh, do you have any anything that is happening at the moment that you wouldn't have foreseen a couple of years ago? Yeah, I think I think what you're starting to see is, um, you know, what what I think is really fascinating to me is what's happening with semiconductors, like how this whole model of semiconductors is, is shifting uh, and I never thought that you would see now um, I'm not sure how much you and your audience know, but there's really three general categories of semiconductors. There's the commodity semiconductors that, you know, your car has as 80 of them, you know, cheap toys. Yeah. Stuff like that. Um, and so those are going to be made just in the cheapest you know country possible. Um, then there's the 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 more advanced semiconductors, um, which I think are really in play right now. And you're starting to see um, instead of those semiconductors being made in fewer countries, there's actually global supply chains that are looking to decentralize those um, for a variety of reasons. Some of it may have to do with geopolitics. Some of it, have, it may have to do with just you know trying to balance out some of these things that we talked about. Um, the real uh, challenge is going to be in the advanced semiconductors that are largely related to artificial intelligence. 
Um, and I have a lot of hope that that's going to transform from, you know, from a design, a development model that we're used to in big supply chains. And it's going to move to this smaller customization model, you know, that I'm talking about. Um, and, you know, the real fascination I have on this whole thing is um, how we're going to look at not just the production of goods, but the design of goods. And uh, my dream here is how we map the human genome in order to better understand um, health and uh, you know medicine and everything like that. Um, moving towards a material genome model where we map the physical qualities of materials in order to be able to design things in a much different manner than we have in the past. And in my book, I talked about the whole material genome project of you know, improving things from a sustainability standpoint, getting things to market quicker, focusing on customization. And I think what we're going to see in the second half of the 21st century is a complete revolution of what our supply chains look like. And I think that's going to move towards this community bot model. And a lot of the challenges that we talked about today will totally go away. And just to be clear, when you talk about the genome, you meant it in a metaphorical way, right? The way that 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 supply chains are still set up, or did you mean like really human genome and how it interacts with with um? Well, goods? if you if you think about the the human genome was mapped, right, and so it was mapped in a way where it was digitized, and so now we understand the the human genome in order to create pharmaceuticals, create vaccines, create things like that. And if you think about all the materials that we have on the planet, if we did the same thing, if we map these materials and we tried to come up with new designs for semiconductors. So some of the some of the materials that we need for the new economy um, are lacking. You know, we're, we're running out of lithium we're running out of sand and things like that. And so if we create a digital design and then we digitize materials, we can improve the environment and we can also change how our supply chains work. So today, when we come, when we design a product, that's not how we do things, right? We base it on less, um, much more limited op, uh, information, which, you know, if we digitize everything, it creates a new revolution for design to production. True, true. Um, and one of the interesting things also about then going back to the semiconductors is that it's not just the design and it's not just the technology, but it's also the capacity to build at scale. And that does not, it, it because that requires a different kind of technology, right? You don't need, just need the technology to produce these. You need the lithography. The lithography to right. produce it, the lithography needs to be built at scale. And that's, those are some secrets that are, kept, that are kept very closely. And even though you can see the Western hemisphere trying to to link up the US has tried the two main producers of this lithography technology to basically um, create common understanding and that's Japan and the Netherlands and in Japan there is even is a trade representative from the Netherlands to liaise with the Japanese in order to to have an understanding about what we allow to be exported from us to China and so on so there is a ganging up going on right mm. definitely but um the on the other hand, the Chinese have been able to like advance very very quickly in lithography as well. Um, are there any roadblocks, you know, uh, supply chain roadblocks for either of these two networks? Um, let's say rare earth minerals or something that could stand in the way of of you know massive uh, production of these very crucial chips. Yeah, um, and you know maybe if if I can talk about this a little broader about just what's happening in the green economy and when it comes to you know, all these rare earth minerals and lithium and all these materials. Um, it's not necessarily an extraction problem. It's a processing problem. Um, in fact, we don't, I think it, you, you brought up the you know, lithography. It's, it's kind of that same issue, right? It's the processing of the materials in order to be able to, to, to meet up to scale. And that was my point regarding design is our limitations today are based off of just a few um, available um, producers of these. And, and so if we move to a, a digital design model, now all of a sudden, instead of focusing on large economies of scale to make these chips, you focus on a decentralized model because the design becomes digitized and you're using um, 
using technology like 3D printing to produce these things as opposed to traditional manufacturing. Right, right. And then the, the distribution of this kind of technology like 3D printing will then lead to the next leap forward in manufacturing, actually. Exactly. Yeah. So this is my great hope of the decentralization of manufacturing in a way where uh, the old model is you continue to build scale in order to increase production. And the new model is you use digitization and technology to in increase scale through decentralization as opposed to mass production. And we actually have, you know, this whole concept of mass customization has been around for decades. And we actually have the model today to move away from mass customization to, to individual, you know, localized customization, which is eventually not in the next five years, but the scale should be able to compete against our mass production models of today and a few decades. Right. So would you think that um, the change we are witnessing right now? So we've seen, we've had the Cold War, and then we've had a period that we used to call the post-Cold War. And I think okay. right now we're seeing how this period is being renamed to the unipolar moment or whatever. Like there's a new description for these 30 years. And now we've definitely, everybody agrees we've entered something new since 2022. And is this new era of multipolarity or whatever you want to call it, is this going to be, in your view, a roadblock toward a more efficient um, supply chain or supply network building? Or is it just going to be an uh, a push to a new way of structuring the global economy the reason why i'm smiling is we're we're at the fork in the road of that question that you ask and the fork in the road is is that in my book i talk about the challenges of large institutions so when we talk about how we fix these problems typically the conversation is one side's in favor of large private institutions on the other side is in favor of large public institutions, you know, fix the problem through government or fix the problem through large uh, corporations. And I think if now the large corporations are going to continue to do what they do, it's up to the public um, governments to enable this new model for their society to flourish. And if nothing changes, um, this model of uh, dual polarity, whatever you want to call it, will continue to lead to um, this imbalance between supply and demand, which is creating havoc both in society. And it's also coupled on top of problems of sustainability where um, you know, we're not creating innovation in order to save the planet. So from a public standpoint, we have an we have a environmental problem. We also have a societal problem of income inequality. And my solution, Pascal, is the only way to get there is to enable the technology and the capitalism towards the smaller model to let the, the technology enable this multiplier effect between supply and demand. I mean, we will see some form of decentralization in a, in a multipolar model because simply the 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 big power one the big powerful ones which used to provide all the public goods globally are are not alone anymore and they they don't want to provide the public goods to everybody anymore, right? The US model today is not to say like, oh, everybody use our SWIFT system. It's worldwide global. It's like, no, 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 Russia, you are not allowed to use it. And the Chinese might also be kicked off it. You know, you start to, to have the public good sector, sector like shrinking and then others popping up. So in a sense, it, this is going to lead to fractalization, but also to, uh, to an increase in in um, supply of or potential supply of public goods um so i wonder if that is not actually a good thing for this supply and demand view of how how uh, humanity like develops yeah I, you know to answer that question i have to go back to my childhood and you know it was inevitable that manufacturing was going to leave my hometown what was not inevitable is what the government did about it and so the point of view is, well, everybody's just going to become a white collar worker and everybody's going to go to college. Um, and that didn't happen. Right. And so over the last 30, 40 years, we see white collar wages going up and we see blue collar wages going down. 
So we see these fractures that exist in society, which, you know, if you follow elections around the world, in my country, for example, you start to see people who are really pissed off because they're they're considered to live in flyover states or fly drive around cities. Um, and so the problem is that um, you have to address that problem. Um, and you have to address that problem by, you know, all these decisions that are being made to decouple is who is this going to benefit? And um, how can we enable more people in, in the United States or any country to benefit through capitalism? It's not handouts or anything like that. And so you're not going to incentivize large corporations to go into these cities. They're just not going to do it. And so I agree with what you're saying. And I do think that, um, you know, you're starting to see this happen, but it's not addressing the root cause problem. And that is that for um, a lot of people in Europe and the United States and all over, that they're on the outside of the supply chain. Yep. Bring people into the supply chain and and for decent wages and decent uh, living standards. And let's figure out a way to do it globally and then we'll have a happy ever after. But I would like to thank you very much. Uh, that's Professor Jack Buffington from the University of Denver for taking the time today. Pascal, I really appreciate it. Thank you.